Hey, that's such a, that's such a lie. You just sold me on the fact that you don't like to sell. <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm not a sales guy. I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I'm not a hard, a hard sell. I, I'm more about building the relationship. Hey guys, today's guest is Oliver Nouveau, the director of operations at United Cigar Company. I'm looking very forward to today's conversation. So let's get to it. Oliver, thanks for coming on to Deep Cuts Live. I couldn't couldn't be happier. Love connecting, uh, you know, with new faces, new uh, new people. I know we you know we just talked about it in the back room. We we met in passing, but uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm blessed to be able to sit down with you and learn a little bit about each other. Me too. Like you know, working. I think we were talking about like we had saw each other at TPE, and mm -hmm. I was at PCA last year. It's almost funny. I almost said this year because it seems weird that we're already in a new year, but. Crazy. I remember your your booth that uh, PCA was just surprising. You know, I think people yeah. think that you know, oh, United is a boutique company, but you all had such a big booth and a lot of stuff going on. It was a, a great presentation. Uh, I didn't have a chance to stop and speak to you at the show, but I did kind of look at your booth and what you all had going on. So, um, congratulations on basically being yeah. at that point where you have, like I said, you know your stuff and you have such a, a great presentation of it wow thank you that that's that's humbling you know working the booths that we had this year was uh was very different uh at the pca we've you know been fortunate enough knock on wood we've had uh, great growth across our portfolio um with nelson alfonso who does selected tobacco his booth was absolutely gorgeous it was um you know like a museum but uh but you're able to you know to walk into it you're you know you're you're comfortable walking into it but when you when you see the way the product's displayed you know you're stepping into something special so you know thank you for recognizing that we he put a lot of hard work into into designing that booth and this pca this past one in 2022 was actually the the first year that united cigars separated themselves in a in a way we separated ourselves in a way from the selected tobacco booth itself where in the past we were all together in one booth but as as nelson's lines were growing he was adding this year added the alfonso line added the byron 1850 line and then on the united side we took on distribution for arnold andre which is a 205 year old company uh took on their their products um Terra Nova and Montosa. Then we took on distribution for more lines uh, from Jose Dominguez, from Carlos Guillermo. We took on Jose Dominguez, Hightower. We took on Yaya. So there was a lot of growth on both sides. So we're still connected, uh, and so we were across from each other. But uh, but yeah, a little bit, a little bit more separation than uh, than years prior. Well, like I said, it was definitely memorable. So I think you did <laughs> accomplish whatever you wanted to accomplish uh, at thank that you, show. Like I said, uh, and I heard a lot of people. Uh, especially media kind of talking about what you all were doing at the show so uh, oh, thank i you. think that's this a sign that, that you you really kind of maybe find like the sweet spot but i'm sure that you're probably like me is it's, it's never you know enough like there's always no. more room to to grow your your brand and what you're doing yeah no i mean you, you you hit it right on the on the head there we're we're growing and now we're we're at the very least um uh, you know scratching the um you, you know the 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 name and the um you know getting noticed by media getting noticed by consumers by retailers at least you know there's there's something there but there's still a lot of work to be done we're you know constantly working on new new projects new collaborations and then working on existing uh portfolio just to make sure that the quality is there and um you know make sure we're, we're presenting the the right product in the end to the uh to the to the consumer well, awesome. Well, before we get into speaking about more about United, I wanted to get to know you a little bit, because like I said, this is the first time that you and I get to, to speak. And I'm always curious about the people behind the brands. I think it makes a, a better connection, like when you're in a humidor and you can actually attach a face to a cigar product. It makes it stand out a lot yeah. more than uh, just seeing a box. So um, is it true that you started smoking cigars in 1989? Um. I saw like an interview. Yes. With a small batch cigar. And I was like, nice. Yeah. I, I know I was 16. So I, I go back to it and I'm always, you know, now it's, I have, you know, I'm turning 50 this year, man. Um, wow. So, you know, yeah, it sneaks you know, up. Look, on that's, I was like, yeah, I was like, let uh, me do the math. I was like, you, is this you. the same person? I was like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I do what I can. Um, 
but uh but yeah when, so when i was 16 was really when i when i started and i think that was that was 89 maybe 88 you know whatever give or take it's been been a very long time so um you know having family that that smoke cigars my my family's originally from france we uh, my parents moved to the states moved to boston uh in 70 just 72 73 um, so I was born in 73. So it was right, right when I was born, uh, I was, a, I'm a March baby. So they may have been here a little bit prior, but, um, um, you know, going, traveling back to, to Europe, you know, my, my uncles, everyone's always smoking either cigarettes or, or cigars. My father was a cigarette smoker and a cigar smoker. So I never really gravitated towards cigarettes. There was always something a little off putting, uh, to me. But, um, when I turned, when I was 15, actually, I worked at a at a restaurant. I was a dishwasher. And at the end of the night, you'd have the, the cooks outside, the servers. Everyone's, you know, they're, they're cracking a beer. They're on the dock. They're smoking a cigarette. And I just wanted to kind of be, you know, part of the uh, part of the crowd. So they would give me a beer. They would give me a cigarette. And I just didn't really like it. I was into sports. I, I didn't want to get, you know, involved in it. And, um, you know, one day I just took a, took a cigar out of, my, out of my father's humidor and, uh, lit it up, and from what I remember, going back, and it always changed. I think it was a Fuente was the the first one. I remember the cedar split, so I think it was, uh, you know, the Chateau is what I can what I can remember. But that was that was my first cigar, and from there, I just I absolutely fell in love with it. He had books around. I started reading the books. One of his um, dear friends in the in the hotel business at the Ritz Carlton was Henry Sheline, and Henry Sheline was a, a huge cigar smoker. Uh, actually wrote a book with um, with Di Miola, who was with not wasn't Altidus at the time; it was consolidated. Mm-hmm. And so there were there were books and there was information. We'd go you know go on trips and vacations, and you know Henry Sheenland was there, and again big cigar smoker. So there was always you know you have this big uh, you know this big Austrian that had a cigar jetting out of his mouth and always smoking. So it was just it was always part of me. And yeah, when I was sixteen was uh, you know when I started, and then from there just you know blew up uh uh you know just loving cigars and and my first premium box um it was my senior year at at boston college and i bought a 10 count box of teamos that was wow. my first yeah my first my first premium box that i felt like uh you know i i you know started to uh started to evolve in the cigar business it's always interesting because i always ask people what was their first cigar but maybe even a better question is like what was your first box because that's like a, such a big investment. That's <laughs> you know, a big, that's yeah, like, that's a big that's step. A big commitment, like when you, yeah. say, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to go for the single cigar. I'm going to go for a box now. Yeah, yeah. My <laughs> first box, money. yeah, first box that I bought, I actually had a, because we lived in, so my father was in the hotel business and, um, you know, spending time, you know, growing up in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chicago, um, london for a little bit we, we moved around we ended up in new york city for one year for my freshman year of high school and um i actually ended up you know getting a, a fake id just to say i was 18 mm-hmm. so that we could get into these these clubs to see some concerts so then a year after i moved to back to massachusetts uh with my family and i was i was only 16 but i had an id that said i was 18 so my first actual box was a box of it was a 50 count box of sweeties that I bought for a school ski trip where we all went up to Canada. So not even thinking, not even really understanding, you know, premium side and Hey, we're going up to Canada. I can probably pick up some, you know, some Cubans up there or some nice cigars. I bought a box of 50 sweeties and and that was the, that was the hit up at the, uh, up at the ski lodge. <laughs> um, you mentioned your father and not him being in the hotel business. What did you kind of learn from your father about business? And like, how did you, like, how have you applied some of those things that your father kind of taught you or the influence that he had on you, like to what you do today? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because there's so much, you know, back then that I'm like, you know, you roll your eyes cause it's mm-hmm. your, your father, but the attention to detail, um, you know, we would, we would walk into restaurants, you know, be it, uh, you know, an IHOP all the way up to, you know, the, the finest restaurants, um, uh, you know, in, in, at the time New York city or, or around the country or Europe. And it was always these little details that he was, you know, just looking without necessarily, you know, directing it towards me, but just talking about it. So his eyes were always over all over the room. Um, you know, one, you know, a memory that I have with him when we would, 
leave the restaurants was at the time there was no internet. So you couldn't Google the restaurant and see what they're serving, look at their menu, you know, looking at the competition. So menus would go in the back of my shirt, tucked into my pants, then my shirt would go over and we'd walk out of the restaurant with a menu in the back because uh, that was his research. So he, he used to have stacks and stacks of menus, whereas now you can just, you know, you go on Instagram, you can see their, mm-hmm. their plate of food, you can go online. But um, yeah, I would say, you know, the attention to, to detail uh what's the big big pull away takeaway from uh from those years it's funny how much the internet has really changed life and i know we're getting to that point where most people born now have grown up with the internet <laughs> right and i remember 1997 ish or so when like you know we had american o- online and you know the dial up sounds yeah. and stuff like that and how it was like such a a novel idea and i think we had like time limits like you wouldn't just have unlimited internet you had like time limits that it was yeah. such a weird time of uh <laughs> and you know and it's just like transform business now it's just like now we're, we're, it's, it's we're connected all the time 24 hours a day and it's just yeah such a short amount of time business. yeah You're right when you, when you think about it it's such a short amount of time when you're talking 97 mm-hmm. uh i was still 20 you know 20 plus years but you're you so much advanced in that time you know the you know going on the internet trying to find something there were you, know, you couldn't throw a gps on your phone you know put it on some magnet that's now on on the dashboard for you and and take you to wherever you want to go or switch plans in the middle if you made plans and you mapped it out that's where you're going there's you know no dvd for it because you know you, you only have the uh the map highlighted or you only printed out uh whatever you did from was it map quest that quest was I was about to say it was the map quest days. You had the little map, yeah. and you would, even that was like I remember it was like oh like oh my gosh we got like directions to anywhere we want to go, and you would just like sit there and like trace along the map. And now even that is like archaic. It's crazy yeah. how how much technology yeah. just has advanced. So ten years from now we'll be in a completely different <laughs> the the the, the there will, I'm sure there will be like a computer or navigation system built into the windshield, and they'll just show you get into this lane get into that lane it'll be yeah you know crazy yeah but anyway yeah, yeah. sure how did you get into the cigar industry um so i i i finished up uh, at bc in 95 and then i started working in in boston i was working for uh, you know small pr uh, company and doing doing advertising and, and marketing and you know just working on um different events uh for the company and then in 90, 97, I moved out to Las Vegas, October 97. And I was uh, just doing freelance graphics. I started uh, you know, doing design work and brochures, business cards for uh, a radio station. There was Carl's Jr. I was doing the, you know, the tray liner and um, just keeping myself busy and keeping myself employed because going from Massachusetts where I had a studio uh, apartment for, I think I might have been paying thousand or eleven hundred at the time in the north end Mm -hmm. to go to vegas with two buddies uh we were renting a house for 900 total three bedroom house for 900 so it was you know we were blown away like you know we didn't even know what to do um so i could just do this you know this freelance work and then in 98 um you know i said it was the spring of 98 i said well all right i want to get you know something something else a little more you know stable a little more structure and obviously there are tons of casinos there so i was applying for for work um at the different casinos in the marketing department and it just you know for me it wasn't the right fit i wanted to stay away from corporate um the corporate world because i think prior to that i had seen a lot of friends and and families their fathers were stripped of everything they had done fired like top ceos top guys from their corporate jobs after spending 20 plus years with them. So I just had a bad taste. I didn't want to do it. And, um, you know, I told myself, well, I smoke cigars. Let me see if I can get a discount. I actually looked these guys up in the phone book and started working for Fryboy tobacco in Las Vegas. And I was just working in one of the, one of the shops. I wanted, uh, you know, something that would give me a little bit of freedom. And, um, that was April of 98. And I'd say within, within a year, I was, um, you know, running one of their, their stores. And then, 
um, helped open up uh, a couple of their locations. And then they brought me into the office and started doing their marketing and then turned into, um, you know, more the more the right hand uh, guy for uh, Michael, Michael Fry out there. And um, it turned into 14 years with with uh, with Fryboy Tobacco. So that was the uh, that was a start. And then there was a little little dip where I got out of it. We with Fryboy Tobacco, um, we started getting more into hospitality. So they mm-hmm. opened up Casa Fuente at uh, at at Caesars. Um, then they went into Rum Bar uh, at the Mirage. There was a restaurant at the Luxor called Tacos and Tequila. So that was just no no cigars, but just all hospitality. So that was kind of the direction they were going in. And with my background, um, you know, I, I gravitated towards it. I was working at Rumbar and uh, and running that for the opening. But I saw the direction and I think Vegas lifestyle, the nightlife. I didn't want to start working the, you know, the late nights and the, the weekends. Mm-hmm. And because I had seen my, you know, see my father in a hotel and it's just, um, you know, it's taxing. It takes it takes a lot of your time away. But I wanted to get away from that, but I ended up moving to um, to Utah and worked with a uh, a friend out there, and he opened up a restaurant in Salt Lake City and did that with him, and then ended up coming back as the food and beverage director in Massachusetts at the Hilton. So I was out of the business for for a little while, but then 2016 uh, jumped uh, on the United Cigar side just as uh, you know is not really in passing, but it was just a, it was a meeting um that we had and met with david Garofalo of uh of, of two guys and he had united cigars and we hit it off and from there it uh it turned into what we have today and uh united cigars so. so i know you handle sales and sales is always something that interests me because i can't imagine myself i, I cringe at having to, to try to sell somebody on something so so what about it kind of appeals to you Hey, that's such a, that's such a lie. You just sold me on the fact that you don't like to sell. <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm not a sales guy. I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I'm not a hard, a hard sell. I, I'm more about building the relationship. Um, when, when I came on to United Cigars in 2016, it was, it was in the sales role because we had, you know, it was maybe 20 accounts, uh, across the country and nobody knew the portfolio. Uh, nobody understood, you know, at the time, Adam and Byron and, and um, you know, it's really let's hey, this is what we have. We have a portfolio of at the time, maybe 12 uh, different brands. Do you want to take this nationally and and see what you can do with it? And, um, you know, I smoked the cigars. I fell in love with them. I thought they were you know great products. Um, the the Adam and Byron, I thought were out of this world. And I took on as opposed to taking on the role of strictly sales, I took on more of an operation role where, you know, I was using my, um, you know, creative background to start to redesign the, the packaging, mm-hmm. um, you know, my, my palette, maybe because of all the, the restaurants and the, the training that I had uh, sublimely received from from my father, how to how to taste different tobaccos and how to start blending cigars and um, you know, so I took on more of an operations role, and yeah, now for United Cigars, I'm um, you know more overseeing the the entire operation. We have we have seven uh, representatives on the road. Um, you know, just bringing on now somebody to oversee the the marketing side of United Cigars. So you know, slowly slowly growing, but um, but it's been uh, yeah, it's been a been a challenge from the beginning. But you know, really for me, build a relationship. You know, sales and money will come after. And I was going to ask you, like, when today when you have to market or sell a cigar, like, how do you do it? And I ask that because, again, when we're talking about, like, the past, it used to be that people only had to, like, throw in an ad to maybe Cigar Aficionado back in the day. Right. And the cigar kind of sold itself. Or to back this magazine, I think, was around back then. And, yeah. it, like, it sold, it sold itself. And now today it's like you have so much going on. It's like. You know, you have Instagram, you have uh, YouTube, so you have you know videos starting to come up as as being a sales thing. So, in your experience, like how do you you know get your product in front of people today? Yeah, so that's um, you, you know it's a little bit of a challenge, but it's we're much better off than what what we were before. 
um, because you, we have a louder, louder voice. It's easier to reach more people. Um, there are there are better publications out there. You know, more publications. Um, there are more cigar enthusiasts that are getting behind the camera and starting to educate other uh, cigar smokers out there. Uh, there are more and more forums on Facebook and um, you know, all these different platforms where people are talking about cigars and sharing like interests and, and cigar might be the common denominator. So when, you know, when, when I'm looking at a, a product and uh, I, I guess if I strip it down to 2016, when I started with United, it was, it was Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. That, that for me was, um, you know, the, the workhorse that that's what drove um, the awareness of the product. When I, when I was trying to search for anything in our portfolio, I couldn't really find it out there. There might've been one or two, but they were, you know, older, um, you know, pictures or, or posts. And, you know, I was trying to get the awareness out there. So I just started, you know, building the, the account and building the relationships with uh, consumers out there. So uh, I, I think, you know, if it's a, if it's a question of, you know, a new product in our portfolio or a new, you know, new company coming out, it's, it's really, you know, one, obviously you have to have a good product that you believe in um, to the, the right packaging. And there are so many amazing, um, you, you know, amazing manufacturers and, and not even, you know, not even manufacturers, I'd say just entrepreneurs, because mm -hmm. I think now you have more people out there that don't manufacture the cigar, uh, may not even travel down to, you know, any of the countries that produce cigars, but they have a connection. They start working on a, on the packaging because everyone is more accessible now between the, the printer, the box maker. So they can, they can have all these contacts and actually produce an end product without ever touching tobacco outside of U S soil. So, you, you know, you have, you have two sides that, you know, they have the, the one that's really trying to manufacture a product that's on the shelf in the box. And then you have the entrepreneurs that are kind of coming out with these five packs or, you know, these, these one-offs or, you know, these drop uh, productions that, you know, it's a short run. They have a cigar, they put brilliant packaging on it. You know, some, some brilliant, some not so much. And, uh, and, and then they, they make a business out of it. So, um, you know, it's really just, I think, believe in the product, having that enthusiasm behind it. Uh, and then figure out where to where to launch it is uh, is key. You know, when I think it was last year, I want to say I was talking to Kathleen Kelly from Queensbury mm -hmm. Cigar Company. She was mentioning we were having a conversation about something and she said, oh, do you know Oliver? And I was like, no. Wow. And she was and she mentioned you. She's like how great you are and your sense of humor. And if, you, if people know Kathleen, you know, you have to have a sense of humor to, to you know, she's very funny, but she knows her business. Um, and I was, you know, and I just thought, as you just said a few minutes ago, that the cigar industry is so relationship driven. Um, and I know that you probably are dealing with, you know, retailers more so than almost anyone, um, you know, getting to know them, keeping up that relationship, figuring out what they need, what's not going right. Um, I'm always curious for people who like you who are on the ground, like when you're dealing with retailers today, like what are they saying to you? Like, what are they dealing with? Because I feel like their story sometimes get gets a little bit lost in the fold. Like we only like hear about them when it when it's a trade show season <laughs> and then yeah. they, uh, they all come out and then it's like they disappear and and we don't really focus on their story. So for you, like when you are talking to retailers today, we're in 2023, um, you know, what are some of the issues that they're facing? Like, what are they going through? And, and how are you trying to help them through United, at least with some of their problems? Yeah. So uh, some of the, some of the things I, I hear now is the, uh, you know, some of those pain points, um, you know, the economy is obviously a big one. Um, I'll kind of keep states and, um, and, and, you know, retailers out of, you know, out of this, you know, names at least out of the equation, but, you know, just visited one state and there were, um, you know, there was one store that was just broken into because, you know, those hard times, it doesn't only mean the customer's not coming in and spending as much. Uh, it means that, um, you know, they're, they, their sales may be down that day, then they're going home and they have to, you know, go to the, go to the store and buy, buy food for the family. And, you know, it's hitting them there and then they're going home. And then all of a sudden they come in the next day and their front doors, it absolutely smashed in. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they're, they're dealing with that. So, um, you know, right now there's, uh, you know, harder, harder economic time. And, you know, the, you know, we see it a, a little bit, uh, you know, even with our, our luxury side of the, the Atabe environment, Atabe right now is probably our, you know, our number one in the, in the portfolio. Um, we had big sales right towards the end of the year, sold through the line, and now we're we have a lot of back orders that will start filling in. Uh, you know, this this month that the the product's about to land uh, should be next week. But you know, who knows what's going to happen? We're we're a company because I came from you know all sides of of the business. I believe that one, it's just it's courtesy. Uh, it's another touch on the on the retailer. You call the retailer first make sure that they're ready for the product you know hey do you remember you you had this on back order you ordered it this was back in november you ordered it in december it's now back in stock you have four boxes of this two boxes of this five whatever the order is you know are you ready for for that and can we add anything else to the order it's just it's a touch it's common courtesy and there's mm-hmm. there's cash flow for for a business so you want to make sure that you're not just drop shipping them a, a five thousand dollar order and they weren't expecting that, or they're just about to put in another order for something else. So, um, you know, the, the economic, um, uh, impact is, is, is probably one of the, the biggest issues right now. Uh, I know, you know, what does United Cigars do? Well, someone like Kathleen Kelly, uh, you know, at Queensbury, we've worked closely, uh, with them and a lot of, uh, the retailers in New York because they have a high tobacco tax. So with United Cigars, we protect all of our, uh, pricing online. There's no heavy discounting. Um, you know, we don't allow it. There's zero discounting on Atabay and, and Byron. So we try to protect that so that there's at least a, an even playing field. Um, mm-hmm. We have products that that do support those high tax states as well. Uh, we have a line called Dos Ombre, where we actually provide the, the, the retailer with their state's tobacco tax back in, in, uh, in products. So we're, we're kind of you know, you're looking at the cost of one box. Well, now you extrapolate that over, you know, more cigars, the cost reduces per cigar. So they're able to at least start to compete with some of those states that have lower taxes or, or no taxes and the online guys. So, you know, we, we try to do what, uh, do what we can, but it's, uh, yeah, it's not, not an easy battle either. Yeah. And I know from um, some of the pre-interview stuff that we were talking about that, you know, you all are focused on the brick and mortar a lot um in every state and i I would take that probably um maybe because of of dave i know being a a retailer of brick and mortar um just talk a little bit about why brick and mortar is so important because again i think we're living in this digital age where people get focused on online retailers and you always hear this in the cigar industry like you know the online versus brick and mortar you know, online can offer discounts that brick and mortar obviously can't, you know, and then the consumers is stuck in the middle of the manufacturer. Sometimes it's stuck, stuck in the yeah. middle of the battle. <laughs> so yeah. just speak a little bit about the, the, the brick and mortar and, and why that's such a big focus for um, United. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, United Cigars started in 1901 um, as as a retailer, uh, built it up to over 3000 accounts and then you know unfortunately the the company dissolved and uh and then dave picked it back up the the name the the branding back in um in 2009 and yeah he's he's been in retail for over 35 years um you know my first cigar wasn't necessarily in a lounge because i was underage but you know some of my best smoking experiences have been in lounges interacting with people that i i wouldn't normally have the opportunity to to interact with um you know, smoking a cigar is very personal. Um, it's very, uh, it's very intimate when, you know, you're sitting down you're cutting and you're lighting just the, between the heat, the, um, you know, the, the flame popping up, the smoke, the smell, it, it touches on all, all your senses. And to, to be able to sit in a lounge, um, you know, only elevates that experience. And if we just concentrate on, you know, catalogs and online, because it's a little bit, you know, a little bit cheaper than it is at my local mm-hmm. brick and mortar, we're going to lose that experience. And, it, you know, that's why we we try to make sure that there's no deep discounting on our product, because when somebody comes into a retail shop and they see our product on the shelf, it might be a little bit more than it would be online, only because maybe that state has a high tobacco tax. Right. But 
if they're supporting the brick and mortar and they're going in on a regular basis and they pay a little bit more it, at the end it's not going to hurt your pocket it's going to keep your lounge in business and you know keep it going um allow them to provide you wi-fi you know the tvs the you know the drinks whatever other amenities they have in the in the sort of make you feel comfortable but you know that's and, and and look if you're in business um you know no matter what business you're in to sit in the lounge you're gonna you're gonna network um take us through the portfolio so i know you have cigars at every price point you have a, a several different brands that you all offer. So, what is there to look for? Uh, what is there to look for from Unitas? So, so to look for, we we have everything. You know, as you said, from a two dollar cigar, our our Desperado line is a two dollar um, cigar. But then we also have the United Pencil. Uh, it's a twenty eight ring gauge, uh, about a six inch. It's a nice in between cigar. And then it goes all the way up to the Byron eighteen fifty at seventy five dollars. So there's a little bit of something for for everyone. We have you know we. We have cigars produced in in all the the major countries: Dominican, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Um, we have something that's mild, medium, full. So the portfolio is there to try. And, and when you're when you're looking at it, uh, you know if you're if you're a bundled cigar smoker or your retailer that's looking for a, you know a quality bundle, our classic line comes in four different wrappers. Um, we try to do exciting projects where yes, we're called United Cigars, but then we kind of incorporate that into our our feel and, and what we want to you know portray as a company and that's where we do our collaboration so retailers that are in the united uh cigar family so to speak or they're our preferred united cigar retailers if they carry the united portfolio or say they carry the firecracker which is a three and a half by 50 with uh you know with the wick at the end um if they carry the united firecracker then they have access to these limited releases that we do and Last year, we had the Bandolero Firecracker. We re-released the Wise Man Maduro Firecracker from the year before. Um, you know, we've worked with Perdomo, which was a phenomenal uh, release for the Firecracker. The, the Mi Carita um, turned into the Tricky Traca Firecracker, which turned into the Tricky Traca line. So that collaboration and that that worked because, you know, Steve Saka wanted to tweak the blend a little bit for the, the Firecracker. He ended up turning it into a blend that he really liked and that did really well for him that he turned it into a line. So, you know, we try to work with with these manufacturers and, um, you know, the, the lines are, are, are fantastic. That Firecracker is going to give you a nice, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of of smoke and then then it leads into you know la giana we make at the camacho factory so you got great quality um you know our garofalo lines made at, at that's our nicaraguan that's made at the perdomo factory um montosa and terra nova great you know lines under the ten dollar range that's a you know another thing with our portfolio we try to we try to be budget friendly as well uh you know provide a great cigar without just putting um you know, just putting a cigar out there with a with a price point that, uh, you know, if it doesn't deserve it, but we're on the eight dollar, ten dollar range, you can have some some great cigars, and and that's what we we hope we're we're putting out. Uh, we just launched the La Mezzo Cubana last year. It's a nice short Rothschild, uh, great flavor, but it's a six dollar cigar, so you can't you, know, you really can't can't beat it. It got a ninety you know ninety rating uh, for a six dollar cigar, so we were. You know, we were very proud of that. And um, and then, you know, then it goes into our, you know, our, our core United line. And, uh, and then you start getting into selected tobacco with the Bandolero right around the teens. Uh, that's a cigar that's aged post-roll for a year to two years. Um, our Red Anchor we just launched last year with the, with the Kellner family at KBF. Uh, that's a phenomenal cigar right around the $25 price point. But uh, absolutely beautiful, beautiful cigar. And, uh, and then when you go into Atabay and Byron, Alfonso, and uh, the Byron 1850, those cigars are pretty special because they have that extra age post roll anywhere from three to five years, depending on the on the line. But uh, what Nelson does, and I know we, we haven't had a chance to, to talk about it, but the story behind Nelson's unbelievable. Um, the, these cigars that he lays to rest after they're rolled, um, they're placed into a humidor with five different cedars, Cuban, Spanish, Mexican, Brazilian, and Lebanese. And for one year, the humidity is brought down to 40%, then back up to 70%. So the cigar is breathing and purging any other impurities. Then after that first year, they're taken out of that aging room. They're placed into another aging room with the same cedars, 
And it's the same process of 40 to 70. But that first year, he wants to make sure that the cigar is done. You know, it's past that sick sickness point. All the ammonias are taken out. Every other impurity is taken out. And then now it can really concentrate on absorbing all those different cedar notes. Um, so it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty special portfolio when you, when you look at something from the Desperado at $2 to the, the Byron 1850. Yeah. And I guess if someone is new to cigars and they see these different price points, you know, I think automatically if you're new to cigars, you kind of look at a cigar that's $5 and a cigar that maybe is $30 and you think, what's the difference? Like is the $30 one, you know, what makes the $30 one a $30 cigar? Like, how do you respond to cigar smokers when they look at price point and they want to know, like, why is this cigar seven dollars and this cigar thirty or forty dollars? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many layers uh, mm -hmm. of that. If we just look at, you know, something like our our portfolio, when you look at, say, the United the United line, we you know we still want to make sure we're using uh, great uh, great tobacco. Uh, it still goes through the the proper fermentation process so there are there are steps um when you look at the amount of steps that are taken to bring a cigar to market you, i'm i'm always surprised that there are cigars at two dollars or that cigars are on average right around ten dollars because there are so many hands that touch it the the packaging and the setup and and all the factors the time and uh and effort that go into making cigars so you know, in that in that range, everyone's kind of comfortable now with ten to twelve worlds. Before a ten dollars cigar, when you know, kind of when I you know started smoking, a ten dollars cigar was like a you know a big premium. Like why you know why are you paying so much? Uh, I think it was the Diamond Crown that, um, yeah, it was right around seventeen, and people were you know scoffing at it uh, a little bit, and they were like, wow, that's you know an expensive cigar. So when you start to go into those higher price points, yeah, what what justifies it? And for for the Bandolero, um, for our Atabe and our Byron, it's the time that's put in the extra aging, um, the extra fermentation. Uh, he, he goes through about five different fermentations for the tobacco, and then the tobacco is aged. Once those cigars are rolled, going through the, you know, just as any scotches or whiskeys or wine, when, once you're adding five years onto a cigar post roll, um, it it goes up in in value, and there's there's time sitting on on tobacco. Um, so that's where the you know the extra you know the extra comes in on top of the 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 raw materials that are are used and the rollers uh that that nelson in particular you know because the those lines are are uh, a little more elevated in price um you know those rollers roll about 150 cigars uh, a day and that's it and they're capped off there's no there's no rush for them so um yeah it's a little elevated in price but hopefully the the experience that that people have with those lines is is second to none and can you talk a little bit more about Nelson? Because I want to make sure he gets a, a little bit of a spotlight in this interview because I know he's so important to United. And also he's becoming a, a real VIP in the, um, just in the cigar world in general. I see so much, so many people talking about cigars that he makes and um, ha has a part in. So could you just tell people out there a little bit more about him and what he does? Yeah, uh, yeah, brief, yeah, brief history on Nelson because I don't, you don't know him at all. And and for you, you know, if you have a chance to sit down with him, he's he's an amazing, amazing man. So he was, um, you know, by by trade, he was a photographer, a painter, and uh, you know, just very a very passionate um, Cuban. And uh, his family moved to Sweden uh, a little while after that. Then they moved back to Cuba, and and that's really where he, you know, got his uh, got his roots and. He was in in design work, and um, you know, as I said, when he was doing kind of the photography side and the research uh, on history, he started researching the history of of cigars when he met his grandfather for the first time um, when he was uh, 20, 24, I think twenty two, twenty four, and his grandfather was the the grandson of Alfonso that started the Byron eighteen fifty line, and. Um, so when Nelson met him, he just he fell in love with tobacco and wanted to to do more with it. So started researching tobacco. Ended up, um, you know, co-authoring the book, I believe, of the World of Habanos, uh, which is a history of all Cuban tobacco. And once he started to to immerse himself in into that, he was doing um, you know design work and uh, you know working on a lot of the the international brands that uh, that are out 
uh, on market now either redesigning them because the lithographs had had kind of you know aged out and weren't you know printing as well as they they were so kind of redesigning some uh some of the old packaging and design work with the jars and you know these humidors that were coming out and then he started to get into tobacco and and realizing that he wanted to do something special so that's where he started to uh, he had a friend that was uh in peru uh had a peruvian farm didn't know what to do with uh his tobacco and nelson started to to work with it and works a lot with peruvian tobacco um and he always says there's a, there's a certain way to to work with it he thinks it's the the best tobacco next to next to cuban tobacco uh he said it's the best tobacco in the world and and when you use it properly it's it's phenomenal so he started to work with it and uh and then that's where he started to develop uh Adabe, who's the the goddess of the taino indians and the name came from his research when he learned that the taino indians would sit in a spiritual circle and and smoke uh, these tobacco leaves that were rolled together, they would blow the smoke to the shaman and tribal leader who was the Bahike. And the Bahike would blow the smoke and the prayers up to their goddess Adabe. So um, that was his, you know, his his story behind Adabe. He wanted to kind of keep that name uh, Adabe for, for himself when he was part of the design and, and work team for the, the new Bahike. Um, and then the Byron 1850 was his family's line in, in the 1800s named after Lord Byron. And, um, he came out with the Byron 1850 in the, he started to develop, uh, you know, work on it in the late 1990s. And then when he came out and, and finalized the blends, uh, I think those, those brands launched right in 2006, seven, eight. So yeah, he's, he's an amazing, um, amazing man, very humble. Um, and, um, I, I wish we could see more of them here in the, in the U S. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking like stories like that are what make the cigar industry, um, so unique yet. We don't hear those kind of stories, unfortunately all the time. So, right. uh, I think if more people outside of cigars heard stories like that, then it will kind of give them a different impression of cigars, uh, and what makes this so different from a cigarette or some other tobacco yeah, product. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's more story. There's more passion, um, you know, behind it than, you know, just turning on a machine in the morning and, you know, making, I don't even know how many millions, you know, per right. day that they make, you know. So, yeah, there's there's a story behind them. Um, tell us about some of the, the latest releases from United, because I know that people, like I said, hopefully they'll watch this interview and they'll want to run out and, and seek out some of your cigars. So, Tell them what they should be looking for right now. That's in oh, I hope so. Yeah, so so right now, what um, what we we launched at this year's PCA, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the La Mezcla Cubana uh, was a nice little nice little grab, um, a shorter shorter cigar, but a phenomenal, nice, easy, mild to medium bodied cigar. Um, the Red Anchor we we launched this year at the PCA with, and again I, I go I say the Kellner family because uh, it was it was originally talked about as a project to work with Hanky Kellner because the family came from Holland originally, and Red Anchor was and is the oldest uh, cigar brand that actually adorned a, a, a cigar band, and um, it was it was a beautiful partnership to to work with them um hanky keller jr was uh was instrumental in um you know helping with the with the blend and we put that out this year to celebrate the 250th anniversary we only did 250 boxes so this year we'll have uh, more production of the the admiral which is a six and a half by 52 that was the one we launched last year and then we're adding four new sizes this year um should be early spring uh we'll be ready for those uh, the firecracker is is one that we're extending uh, expanding the line. Uh, we had the the black bomb that was a five pack release uh, a couple years ago, and that's now going because it was well received. It's going into boxes of twenty five. So that's our Maduro firecracker, and then we'll have the the wild rover, uh, which will be a, a regular production uh, barber pole uh, that will be uh, coming out as, as well in the next uh, next couple of months. Um, and then right, right before the, the holidays, we were able to send out the Alfonso line from, from Nelson, uh, and the Byron 1850. Those two lines are aged same, same as Atabay and, and Byron, uh, for the five years post roll, but 
Nelson started to use French oak uh, in the in the humor to add a different layer of complexity. He wanted to see what it would it would do, and the, the cigars came out um, you know phenomenal. The uh, the tobaccos aged a little bit longer uh, prior to rolling, so it's uh, it offers a, a little more body. Um, there's a little bit more Nicaraguan Lajero in there, and um, it's a, it's it's just a very very well balanced cigar and uh, just beautiful um, uh, beautiful production from him. And then uh, if you if you're out there and you see the Byron uh, at Peak Poema Humidor, um, those are limited. We only did we only made 500 of those humidors. 200 were released last year. Uh, we sold sold out of those, and they hold 30 of the Byron at Peak 19th century uh, cigars. So. Uh, yeah, there was there was quite a bit that uh, that we had out there, and uh, United's going to go through a little bit of a, a facelift uh, as well coming coming soon. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot uh, a lot of products out there with the United uh, branding or or name on it. So keep your eye out. Wow, and I know that you just um, got a new warehouse, you have a new marketing person, so you have so much <laughs> so much going on this year. It seems like it's, like you said, it's like a like the next chapter for United. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been, it's been a lot of work, but um, you know, it's, it seems to be paying off right now and we're rewarded every time, you know, someone picks up a cigar off the shelf and that allows us to just hopefully provide a, a, a better product uh, to everyone smoking out there. Um, as we come towards the end of this interview, I always like to ask two questions and I changed them up to 2023 so people wouldn't, grow hip to what the questions were. But um, the first of those questions is, do you have a philosophy that you live by? Always, always do the right thing. I think, um, you know, just uh, in integrity is such a big, uh, you know, a big part of, of my life, I think. Uh, I think that would be, you know, there's no, there's no set philosophy that I have written down anywhere. Maybe, maybe I should. But uh, yeah, it's you know, always do always do the right thing. You know, do do right by others. Um, and the other question is, um, I want you to finish this sentence. Oliver Nouveau is. <laughs> oh, there's so much. Uh, uh, it, it is is ha is happy in life. Um, you know, there's nothing. And maybe it's the hospitality side. Maybe it's the you know my my French upbringing with, uh, you know, family that was, um, you know, very down to earth, um, you know, our Christmases and, and new years was, you, you know, always just long tables, lots of singing, lots of wine up until, you know, two in the morning. Um, and just, just family. And to me, no matter what I do and, you know, Kathleen, uh, talked about it, you know, she, you know, maybe a little bit of a jokester, uh, when I need to be serious, I can be serious, but, to put a smile on someone's face, like that's the biggest reward uh, for me. Like it, um, that, that really drives me. And if it's, if it, if it, it, it doesn't have to. It's not necessarily that smile means it benefited me either. Um, you know, I think you know. Unfortunately, we just don't know uh, when someone's walking through life, and and you know, they might be smiling on the outside, or they might be smiling on the inside, and they're not showing it just, you know, having, having that conversation and, uh, you know, sharing, sharing a smile and a laugh with someone. Awesome. Now, can you, for those people who aren't watching this, can you tell people what website and kind of social media that they need to, need to follow in order to keep up with United Cigar and also yourself? Abs absolutely. So if, uh, if you're searching online, you want to find a store that, uh, that carries United Cigar lines, you can go to unitedcigargroup.com. And if uh, if you are on social media and uh, you love seeing beautiful pictures from not only myself, but uh, other cigar and United lovers, you can go to uh, Instagram and Twitter. We are at United Cigars and on Facebook, we're at uh, we're at United Cigar Group. 